Good morning. It's Friday, February the 19th, and this is The Drill. Thank you very much. And the prayer of the day comes from the book about uh, daily, daily prayers for uh, spiritual warfare. You are the apple of my eye. I have probed your heart and tested you, and I know that you have no evil plans, and your mouth has not transgressed against me. You have kept yourself from the ways of the violent by following my commandments. Your steps have held to my paths, and your feet have not stumbled. When you call to me, I will answer you. I will turn my ear to hear you and hear your prayer. I will show you the wonders of my great love and will save you by my right hand. Because you are the apple of my eye, I will confront your enemies and bring them down. My mighty sword will rescue you from the wicked. I will vindicate you and you will see my face when you awake and will be satisfied with seeing my likeness and protection. Lord, you found me in a desert land, a howling wilderness, and you encircled me and instructed me and kept me as the apple of your eye. You have promised to shake your hand against those who dare to touch the apple of your eye with trouble. You will cause my enemies to become spoil for your servants. And by this will, everyone knows what I, that I am your inheritance and you have chosen to dwell in my midst. Amen. And uh, I read the prayers, and I like these prayers because, again, they provide the foundation for everything it is that conservatives do. Conservatives are, um, uh, you know, the fight against socialism is really a fight against wickedness. It's really fundamentally a fight against Satan. It's really um, a fight against uh, his demons um, when you get right down to the... Um, The nitty gritty, if you will. Back in a minute. So I'm uh, sitting here thinking about listening to, to uh, some of Hugh Hewitt, but uh, my, mainly thinking about Rush Limbaugh and his intellectual uh, contribution and thinking about how he was, although he, he defined himself as a conservative, and he did so uh, because of what he saw other people do. And he uh, modeled his thinking, his broadcasts after other people, uh, particularly William F. Buckley. And um, so that the people have been confused for decades, for maybe a century, about what conservatism is, going all the way back to Edmund Burke. Uh, Edmund Burke and everybody else up until me and or actually I got to say Ayn Rand properly understood properly thought about Ayn Rand is the first true conservative she called herself objectivist she mocked conservatives and conservatism etc but she was wrong to do so she was from certain mental errors which in a way are, ex are excusable because intellectually the world is a mess an absolute mess and it's a mess that was created by one man uh rene descartes uh so um anyways uh rush limbaugh then followed that tradition of being a reactionary they didn't call themselves reactionaries they call themselves uh conservatives by the way uh burke wrote uh, and created more or less conservatism he didn't call it conservatism but he wrote a book and it was in reaction to the um, French Revolution. And he was opposed to the French Revolution. And in, the, in that book, he explains why. And that was supposed to be the book that 
uh, launched uh, conservatism and this supposed conservative movement. And you know somebody's not a true conservative or doesn't really understand conservatism when they describe it as a movement. Because properly understood, it is no such thing. Conservatism, a conservative is really a normal person. Let me say it again. A normal person. Normal people don't get up and go on crusades every morning. They don't look uh, to be leaders and change agents. They mind their own business and they expect others to do the same. Okay. And, but anyway, so they could describe the conservative uh, movement and uh, consider conservatism as a movement. But really what it was was reactionary. And so um, Burke was reactionary. Uh, and um, you go to Barry Goldwater, who was equally reactionary, and William F. Buckley, who was reactionary. And so Rush Limbaugh learned from those people what it meant to be conservative, and probably from his family as well, from his father and uh, from other family members, uh, what it was to be a conservative, and that was to be reactionary. So every day on his show, when he, when he was doing his show, he rarely said, this is what I'm going to be talking about uh, tomorrow. He wouldn't give you uh, a preview of what he's going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, he also very rarely referred to uh, previous broadcasts or previ yeah, previous broadcasts where he said, well, yesterday I was talking about this, so today I'm going to piggyback on that idea and we will talk about this some more. You won't hear that kind of thing from him. Every day was something um, more or less new, not really, but it was uh, every day as a separate uh, broadcast. It wasn't part of a long continuum like a, a class might be. So he, um, um, yeah, so it was, all, it, the left has always said uh, that you there is no past, there is no future, that it's always successive moments of now. It's one of the things that I used to hear in the 70s, in the me decade, that I always talk about that. It's a very zen thing, but that's crap. Okay, for the average person, the idea that uh, life is nothing but a successive moment of now is crap. Make that absolutely clear. It's an, it is valid idea for the very young, for the very old, and for the terminally ill. Everybody else has to consider the past, has to consider the future, has to be rational, reasonable, realistic, because we have to take care of the very young, the very old, and the terminally ill. But it sounds good. You know, uh, you can go out and do basically whatever you want, and you're not going to have to, uh, you're not going to be waking up in the, theoretically in the middle of the night worried about either the future or haunted by your past. You know, you just uh, disregard both of those things and uh, do uh, do whatever you feel in the moment. That was another thing for for the lefties was feelings. Everything was about uh, feelings in the in the seventies. But um, Rush Limbaugh again. So he another way you can tell. Uh, well, anyways, with his show, basically what he was doing was getting up in the morning. He was doing his show prep of basically reading the New York Times. And then that, that would tell him what it is that he's going to talk about today. So if in the New York Times there's a uh, Nancy Pelosi, a, an article about Nancy Pelosi um, insulting the President of the United States, then that's what he, would talk, he was going to talk about. So he'll clip that article or, or maybe, maybe make notes. I get a, the feeling that, but again, it was just... Um, that he would, uh, you know, maybe make copies or something like that. Because you, could, in his show, uh, you could hear the printer every once in a while. You hear the printer going, Zzzz, and he's printing out some uh, some things. But supposedly, his staff also uh, put together his a stack of stuff. So, but every day it is get up in the morning, check the New York Times, check the Los Angeles Times, check CNN, and then you decide what it is that you're going to talk about. The problem is that you are basically allowing the left to set the tone. You're allowing the left to lead, and you will simply follow the left wherever 
they go. And that's not what uh, conservatism is all about. So the other thing about uh, Rush Limbaugh and what he got wrong besides being reactionary, getting up every day and looking at uh, what it is that the enemy is doing and to try to figure out what it is that he's going to think today, what kind of an opinion he's going to have today, and what he's going to have to say today is the idea of issues. Issues. He was an, an issues conservative and he believed that uh, being a conservative is about where you stand on the issues and the issues were abortion, the environment, war, um, the military, law enforcement and so where you stood on those issues de de defined who you were politically. Now where did we get this idea that it's the issues came from the dissolution of of the Soviet Union, the one of the most earth-shaking events in uh, global history, and yet very little attention is paid to it. There's no book I can find on Kindle in which uh, they talk about the dissolution of the Soviet Union as it affected world politics and American politics in particular. When I grew up, uh, and when I was growing up, I was... From the day I was born until the Soviet Union went away, I was part of the Cold War. There was a Cold War going on with the Soviet Union. All politics was in reference to the Soviet Union. Where you stood in relation to the, the existence of the Soviet Union and what the Soviet Union was or was not doing defined you politically. Okay, If you were hawkish, in regards to the Soviet Union, you are conservative. If you are dovish, you are a liberal. So if you were inclined, if you had the attitude, I guess it's summed up best this way. There was a st uh, statements, two statements. One, uh, better read than dead, and the other one, better dead than read. So if your sentiment ran along the lines of better dead than read, you were a conservative. And if it was better read than dead, you were a liberal. Okay, but everything was in relation to the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union disappeared, um, it, it left us with a political void. Politicians were clueless. They had no idea what to do. We didn't celebrate. You would think it's a, a, a Cold War that's been going on for decades, basically since the end of World War II, but there's no celebration. Uh, George the first refused. He says, "No, no, no, we're not going to celebrate. No, 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 we're not going to. We're not going to do that. He's like that's a good idea. No, it's not a good idea. He should have celebrated it, um, and we should be still celebrating it today. So it was the left in this country that came up with the idea of issues. So they don't know. Well, everybody's lost politically, but especially the left. The right still has patriotism." They still have God and country to lean on as a as political uh, as a um, yeah political motive political identity. That's it. But the left is completely lost. Without the Soviet Union, they have pretty much no identity. They had always counted on the Soviet Union would show the way and show the United States how it's supposed to act uh, and uh, be the ideal and be the beacon for the rest of the world and lead the rest of the world to socialist paradise. And then all of a sudden it falls apart and the left has got nothing except egg on their face. So the left does what it usually does, it just blows it off. And they, they call it on the street playing it off, which means you just basically pretend. You fake it till you make it. And so they said, well, you know what? Uh, politics and, and political uh, battles should be decided on the issues. This is in like the mid-90s, 94-ish, when they started doing this. And I know this, and I remember because I used to watch a lot of C-SPAN. When C-SPAN came on, I was a C-SPAN junkie. I loved to watch C-SPAN. Um, and if I could get it on my uh, TV now, I'd be uh, watching. It's one of my favorite channels. But anyway, so 
I'm watching on C-SPAN and watching these uh, fools in the House of Representatives talking about, uh, you know, uh, we should um, go ahead and um, decide things on the issue. Also, they started talking about how government and business should work together. Always, and that was another way you knew whether you were left or right previous uh, to the breakup of the Soviet Union was uh, your attitude towards business. Uh, the left was always very antagonistic towards business as it, as it is today. Uh, well, not as much as it, as it used to be. Um, because what basically the left did was co-opt business. We went from being a, um, if you want to say, a, uh, a free country, um, being what we were supposed to be, let's put it that way, where the government is a neutral third party and now we have the government telling businesses what it is that they're supposed to do, actively involved in making business decisions, actively involved in, um, uh, actively involved in making business decisions in what is popularly known as picking winners and losers. You have a, a president, uh, an administration, a presidential administration, that is out making sure that certain businesses get rewarded and other businesses get penalized based on ideology. So, um, and that all comes about from again the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the left's idea that the the government and the business should work together. The problem with that idea is that it's fascist. And I'm serious. I'm not using that as just trying to, to slur the left. Go back in history and look at World War II Italy. Skip the, the Germany was a, you know, uh, a different, Germany was similar, but because of all the racist ideology and all, the, all of their fascistic tendencies kind of get lost. But in, particularly in Italy, uh, there was, you were allowed to own a business. You were allowed to have large corporations. They were allowed to exist to be owned uh, by private individuals. But the government reserved the right to tell that business what it will or will not produce, when, how, and in what numbers. Also, the uh, uni there was universal unionization. Same thing in Germany. Germany had one union uh, for all workers, and so, so did Italy, uh, fascist Italy. But again, that's the difference between uh, being a free society. One of the big differences is in a free society, the government stays out of it. The government has its business. It's supposed to create a budget. It's supposed to make sure that we have uh, sufficient military resources so that we're not invaded, that kind of thing. But its, it, its job ends there. And again, in the Constitution, it says it limits the, cons the, the government to... Um, what's in the Constitution. Everything else is up to the states or the people themselves. So the co government, when it's telling businesses, for instance, to produce masks, and we had uh, uh, President Trump, one of the big, big policy errors he made was going out and ordering businesses. If he had asked them, different story, but when he goes out and creates an executive order, there's supposedly some kind of a law, and if, if there's a national crisis, then the, uh, the president will assume the authority to commandeer, basically, uh, businesses and tell them what it is that they're going to produce, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fascistic. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, if businesses want to, in, in a free society, businesses want to decide that it, the patriotic thing to do is to stop doing what we're doing now and do something else, produce something else, create a different service, fine, that's good. But uh, to be told by the government, ordered by the government, subject to um, potential incarceration or fines or whatever, uh-uh, no. That's, that's not uh, democratic. It's not, um, it's not what a freedom-loving uh, society uh, does so, um, but anyways, the point is that I'm uh, getting way off the the track here. We're getting back to the issues. It was in the mid '90s when the left decided that everything should be decided on the on the issues, and 
Furthermore, the left went ahead and decided what the issues were going to be. And when they set up the issues, they naturally set up the issues so that uh, the left wins. We'll take the issue of abortion. That's what the left decided. The issue is abortion, not life, but abortion. So whenever somebody was campaigning for office, the left-wing news people would go to him and say, okay, so where do you stand on abortion? See, and then he's going to have to say, if he's a pro-life individual, he's going to have to say, I'm against it. Then the inevitable question, why? Why are you against abortion? So in other words, they're setting up the left, these issues as presumptions. We presume abortion. We presume for property or I mean in the environment, which doesn't even exist, but what you're doing really is presuming against property and property rights with the environment, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So they were always, all of these issues were presumptions, some of them obvious and some of them uh, hidden. And so uh, that's, uh, that again sets the right up to be reactionary. The left is on the march with abortion. It is the left's job to react to that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and uh, that's not uh, what uh, the left is reaction, or the left sets the, the tone and the right is reactionary. And that's not what being a true conservative is all about. It is about uh, making change when change is absolutely necessary. And the reason that's important is it tells you how you deal with, argue with, Defeat the left. Defeating the left is, is as simple as asking the question, why? Okay, abortion, why? Why abortion? Conservatives don't ask that question, they react. They hear the word abortion, they go, ah, no abortion, it's terrible, it's horrible, it's murder. Instead of, instead of simply defeating it, saying, look, I'm a, uh, I'm a reasonable, rational human being, um, uh, and abortion is uh, not, on the, not on the program, not on the agenda. Why should I support it? Asking for abortion is a change. They're asking for change. Because basically that's what politics is all about. Arguments and debates about change. What should we change? When, where, and how? And so for the average conservative, it's not to resist change, which is what a reactionary does, autom automatically resist change. And a traditionalist uh, uh, defies, uh, not only resists, but defies change. The true conservative agrees that there is time and knows realistically there's times where change is indicated. Slavery, Jim Crow, etc. That's an obvious, those are obvious cases for change. But otherwise, whoever it is that's asking for change has the burden of proof. You have to prove to the true conservative that uh, change is necessary. So again, abortion, why? The left has never answered that question. They've ducked it. They've changed the subject. They want to talk about how it's a woman's body, forgetting that it's also a man's body, because if a man's body wasn't involved, she wouldn't be pregnant in the first place. Um, and they, uh, again, just spend a lot of time uh, changing the subject. Okay, uh, you're pregnant, you don't want the baby, put it up for adoption. Put it up for adoption, simple. But again, they, they don't uh, deal with that situation, they just simply change the subject, and what they will do is try to turn things around and make the conservative prove a negative. So they'll try to turn the argument around and say, not why abortion, but why not abortion? And if you, if you try to answer that question, you've fallen into a trap and you will pay dearly for falling into that trap. You will end up questioning not only your beliefs, not only your political ideas, you will question your own sanity. So, um, again, uh, 
Rush Limbaugh is, uh, he's reactionary and he's stuck on the issues. And the bad things about that is that if you're reactionary, then it's the left that determines your fate, determines what you're going to think about, how you're going to act, what you're going to do, etc. The left is in the lead. And that's exactly where people that are change-oriented want to be. They put you on the defensive, put you in the position to say why, uh, to try to explain why not, which can't be done. And it is the conservatives that are the true leaders. It is conservatism that is, um, that, that should be followed. We are the ones that are the guardians of the status quo, changing when change is obvious. And the way we should be handling the so-called issues is with one word, why? Abortion, why? Environmentalism, why? Feminism, why? But what they've successfully done by making you reactionary is putting you into a position where you have to prove a negative. And that's impossible. If you learn nothing else from this particular episode, learn that it is impossible to prove a negative. And if you're in an argument with a lefty and you're getting that weird feeling that uh, you're losing reality, that weird feeling that you know that you're right, but you feel like you're losing the argument, you've been tricked, you've been had. And more than likely, what they're doing is getting you to try to prove a negative and you're going along with it. And you have to stop it immediately and turn it around and make them prove the positive. Make them define their terms Again, make them explain why. So uh, that's the way uh, to be a true conservative. We're the leaders and uh, uh, the left needs to be following us and not the other way around. That uh, concludes another episode of The Drill. Be honest, be smart, be beautiful. And until next time, I'm Ron, and that's The Drill.